Hi, Daniel. Can I ask you a quick question? Of course. Have you had clients that have applied hedge accounting? If so, what's been your experience with them? Yeah, over the years, people have, you know, many clients have tried to apply hedge accounting and it had, had some areas of frustration. I think some of the main areas of frustration include that their risk management strategies did not actually qualify for the GAAP hedge accounting criteria. Others have, you know, uh, uh, qualified for the hedge accounting, but then had a lot of works to document and maintain the hedge accounting relationship. And I think the final area of frustration would include that it could sometimes result in confusing financial results. Over the years, I've even had one instance where a client later determined after they initially applied shortcut method that they didn't, that they misapplied it and ended up having to go back and restate their financial statements. Oh, wow. Um, those are, you know, some common complaints that we hear often, don't we? Uh, but what if I told you that the FASB is proposing to make it operationally easier for entities while potentially allowing more hedging strategies to qualify for hedge accounting? I think clients would definitely be in favor of the FASB moving in that direction. I've also actually heard that they're going to make some changes to the financial statements to better portray the economic results of the risk management activities. That's right. Uh, hi, my name is Mahesh Narayanasamy, and with me today is Daniel Imperial. We both are from KPMG's Department of Professional Practice based in New York. Over the next few minutes, we're going to have a discussion on the FASB's exposure draft on hedging, which was issued on September 8, 2016. First, at a high level, let us look at what the FASB is proposing to change and what will remain the same. So, what is changing under the exposure draft is that the FASB is planning on allowing entities the ability to apply hedge accounting to components of hedged items. And I'll come back to it in a bit more detail in a later slide. The other aspect that Daniel sort of alluded to is the recognition and presentation of gains and losses on derivative hedging instruments in the financial statements so that they better portray the economic results of uh, you know, companies' hedging activities. And then the last category, I would say, is reduced cost and complexity for preparers. What remains the same would be that, you know, the different hedging models would be the same. So today we have the fair value hedge model, the cash flow hedge model, and the net investment hedge model. Those three would remain the same. Entities would still have to meet the highly effective threshold, you know, the so-called 80 to 125 percent threshold that we're all used to today. That threshold will continue to apply to qualify for hedge accounting. And then all the documentation requirements, um, especially, you know, those um, requirements which would identify the hedged item, hedging item, the risk management strategy, objective of entering into the hedging relationship that an entity would document up front uh, on a contemporaneous basis, those would all continue to apply under the exposure draft. In terms of uh, component hedging or hedging a component of a uh, price of a, a commodity, for example, the, you know, the current gap would allow entities um, to hedge either the foreign currency risk or the overall variability in cash flows of a non-financial item. So if an entity is um, going to buy or sell a commodity, they could hedge if they're exposed to foreign currency risk, just the foreign currency risk, or if not, they can only hedge the overall change in the price risk of that commodity. The, um, similarly, for a financial item, an entity could hedge either the variable rate index, assuming the variable rate index is indexed to a benchmark rate, or if the index is not a benchmark rate, the entity is then um, restricted in terms of what they can hedge, and they can only hedge the overall changes in uh, cash flows of the financial item. What the proposed ASU would permit would be for a non-financial item, if an entity has a contractually specified component within the purchase or sale price of a commodity, they could hedge that contractually specified component. And a quick example here would be an airline company which, uh, say, consumes jet fuel. And because of the volatility in oil prices, they may wish to hedge the price risk. However, they may want to hedge the crude oil component of the jet fuel price and not the other components, you know, for example, the crack spread or other basis differential between crude oil price and the jet fuel price. Currently, the entity would be precluded from hedging 
the crude oil component of a jet fuel price, but under the FASB's exposure draft, they would be allowed to hedge the crude oil component as long as that crude oil component is a specifically uh, identified component within a contract. And similarly for a financial item, that restriction for the index to be a benchmark interest rate is going to go away. Um, so if entities, if uh, you know, they have indexation to a non-benchmark interest rate, for example, a prime-based rate, can identify the prime rate as the hedged risk, uh, again, as long as the prime rate is uh, contractually uh, specified uh, risk component within their contract. Daniel, you alluded to recognition and presentation aspects. Do you want to elaborate on that a little bit more? Sure. Thanks, Mahesh. There's two items that I wanted to highlight with regards to recognition and presentation. The first is with regards to cash flow and net investment hedges. The entire change in fair value of the hedged item would be recorded in other comprehensive income. This would, as long as it meets the highly, highly effective criteria. This would represent a change from current U.S. GAAP, which requires an entity to split the effective and ineffective pieces, with the effective portion going through other comprehensive income and the ineffective portion going through earnings. The second item relates to income statement presentation. Current U.S. GAAP, under current U.S. GAAP, there is no specific guidance on the income statement classification of gains and losses for cash flow, net investment, and fair value hedges. Under the proposed guidance, all of the gains and losses of the hedge item would be presented in the same line item as the hedge, hedge instrument. So we've gone through, now that we've gone through component hedging, presentation, and recognition changes as a result of their proposed A issue, Mahesh, can you walk us through some of the operational simplifications? Sure. Thanks, Daniel. Um, the first thing I wanted to cover with, was with respect to effectiveness testing. As you know, today entities are required to perform their quantitative effectiveness testing at inception contemporaneously with when they entered into the hedging relationship and also along with, you know, the other aspects of the documentation requirements that I mentioned before, such as identifying the hedged item, hedging item, risk management objective strategy and so forth. That did not give entities a lot of time to be able to pull together their quantitative testing. So what the FASB has decided is to allow additional time for entities to perform their initial quantitative testing. So which means that the entities will have now up to the next quarterly testing after hedge inception. So that period of time um, will be available for entities to perform their initial quantitative testing. But of course entities may be eligible for qualitative testing, meaning the critical terms match method and the shortcut method and they will continue to be applicable under the proposed ASU as well. The uh, <clears throat> other area of simplification in my mind is to the extent that an entity is not eligible for the qualitative testing method, being the critical terms match or the shortcut method, the subsequent testing will have to be quantitative under current U.S. GAAP. The FASB is proposing to change that as well, and it's going to say that entities may be able to perform the testing either on a qualitative or on a quantitative basis, on a go-forward basis. And an entity may be able to um, use the qualitative method, and if it thinks that it, it is eligible for that method, it needs to be able to document it upfront at hedge inception and should have a reasonable basis <clears throat> reasonable expectation of high effectiveness in subsequent periods. And there is a downside to this in the sense that if that entity determines that, you know, facts and circumstances have changed later on, that they're no, no longer able to demonstrate qualitatively that they meet the high effective threshold, then they will be required to do a quantitative testing on a go-forward basis. So in other words, once they get into the quantitative testing method, they can never go back to the qualitative method of effectiveness testing. The other aspects that I wanted to touch on are the so-called qualitative method for effectiveness testing. Um, you know, first is the critical terms match method. And as you know, Daniel, if um, an entity were to try and apply the critical terms match method, they'll have to demonstrate that 
the quantity, location of delivery, as well as the maturity date of the hedged item and the hedging item should all match. That's what critical terms match would mean. The uh, proposed ASU would uh, would give them a 31-day window, meaning within the 31-day period, as long as the hedged items and the hedging items happen within the 31-day period, the entity may assume that critical terms match and can therefore up, you know, use this qualitative method instead of doing a quantitative method. The other area that I wanted to touch on, which interestingly you mentioned up front, is this uh, significant penalties that entities will have to um, will have to comply with um, if they were to misapply the shortcut method. So as you said, um, you know, if, if an entity applied the shortcut method and later on determined that they misapplied it, they'll have to go back and undo hedge accounting and and you know. Uh, do their accounting as if they never qualified for hedge accounting to begin with, which might, you know, based on materiality and so forth, might lead to restatement of prior period results. So what the FASB is going to propose in the in the uh, uh, ASU is that if an entity determined later on that the they misapplied the shortcut methodology, the penalty is uh, is much uh, less stringent, I would say, in the sense that. If they were able to go back and quantitatively demonstrate that they qualified for the high effective threshold, and also in their hedge documentation up front, they document what quantitative methodology they would follow if they were to fail to meet the shortcut criteria, then they would be eligible to apply hedge accounting in the prior periods. So uh, the penalty would be much, much less stringent, as I said before. So those are some of the operational aspects and um, um, you know obviously we are not touching on uh, every single aspect of what the proposed ASU contains. The, these are some of the key aspects that we wanted to cover today. That concludes this podcast. Thanks for listening and have a great day.